a couple of days ago on YouTube stream, I went over this document very, very briefly. I thought it was going to be a really short one. I didn't realize it was 53 pages. And we kind of just look at the highlights and things like that. But, you know, I want to read the entire thing. I promise you guys I wanted to read the entire thing. And I'm going to read it to y'all. So this is one of those uh, videos where you can have me playing in the background, whether you're... Oh, whether you're, oh my god my glasses whether you're cooking cleaning or you're driving maybe you're playing video games so have this in the background listen to it and do some multitasking so i usually just read this before i'm about to go to bed but you know what i'm like hey if i'm gonna read it i might as well just read it to someone right if you're interested of course so this was filed on june 1st 2022 and again i still couldn't find this on their fairfax county website maybe it's somewhere else uh, defendant and counterplaintiff Amber Halor Heard hereby moves this court to set aside the jury's verdict on all three counts of plaintiff and counterclaim defendant John C. Depp, Mr. Depp, complained to dismiss the complaint and to investigate improper juror service. The grounds for this motion are set forth in the accompanying memorandum. Respectfully, respectfully submitted, Elaine Brudahoff. All right, Elaine. Wonder what Mr. Roddenborn has been up to. Now we got a little table of contents here. And you know what? You might be intimidated by 53 pages, but this will go by quick, I promise you. It will go by quick. And again, I do recommend, um, listen to this at the speed that you're comfortable at. If I'm going too slow, speed it up. If I'm going too fast, slow it down. Look at this, we're already at the 10th page. Easy cakes. Defendant and counterclaim plaintiff Amber Laura Heard, Ms. Heard, respectfully moved this court to set aside the jury's verdict on all three counts of plaintiff and counterclaim defendant Mr. Depp's claim dismissed the complaint alternative to order a new trial and to investigate potential improper juror service. So this is not a small ask right here, but let's see what else they say. In support, Ms. Hurd relies upon the prior record, including objections and arguments during hearing and at trial, motions and lamine, motions to strike and arguments following. Summary of argument. From the beginning, Mr. Depp set out to try this case a domestic relation dispute he wished he had tried rather than settle in 2016. Mr. Depp counseled argues through the trial that the issues before the jury began six years ago when Ms. Hurd obtained a domestic violence temporary restraining order against Mr. Depp on May 27, 2016. Mr. Depp and his legal team told the jury they were seeking to restore Mr. Depp's reputation and his legacy for his children. That was the first time Mr. Depp was able to tell his story since Ms. Hurd obtained the DVTRO in 2016. And again, that's the same day where TMZ showed up and she had the bruise over her face and she was wearing the black dress and coming out of the courthouse. The claims in this case were far different than the case Mr. Depp tried to the jury. Mr. Depp's claim rose from an op-ed published in the Washington Post on December 18, 2018, two and a half years later. Mr. Depp alleged that three statements, one the titled authored by the Washington Post, formed the base of his defamation claims. To avoid explaining to the jury and the UK final judgment finding Mr. Depp to have committed 12 acts of domestic violence, including S violence, Mr. Depp represented the court. He would limit his damages claim to the period December 18, 2018 through November 2nd, 2020, the date of the UK judgment. So from what I'm reading here, it seems like Elaine and them, they have an issue with um, Camille Vasquez's closing argument and Ben Chu as well. Because Camille Vasquez would say, oh, you know, six years ago was when Mr. Depp um, was trying to seek justice. And, well, I, I wish I had, I remembered verbatim, but you guys remember that, right? Where Camille Vasquez talks about, you know, six years ago in 2016, you know, Amber Heard came and she had the bruise and now Mr. Depp is seeking to restore his reputation, yada, yada, yada. I wish I remember the verbatim, but I don't. See, this is why I wish I had the court transcripts. Yet Mr. Depp made no such effort at any point in the trial to so limit his claim damages. Instead, throughout the closing, Mr. Depp continued to urge the jury to restore his reputation and legacy to his children as a result of Ms. Heard accusing Mr. Depp in May 2016 of domestic violence and obtaining a DVTRO. The jury's verdict was obviously influenced by Mr. Depp's pleas in the face of the court's preclusion of Ms. Heard from introducing evidence that Mr. Depp had already, in fact, been adjudicated in the court of his choosing to have committed not just one act of domestic abuse. All that was needed in this case was for a defense verdict. But 12 acts of domestic violence, including... Okay, so there's a lot of words here that YouTube is not going to like. So I'm going to have to, we're going to have to basically do the kitty version. We'll say like S violence and A violence. And yeah, if you guys uh, don't know what I'm talking about, the, the file is right here. So y'all can read it with me or just 
take a look at it <laughs> to see pause the video and be like oh what is she referring to and then you'll see where i'm at the exclusion of the uk judgment compelled with mr depp's continuous urging to the jury to go back six years and exonerate him and restore his reputation resulting in an indefensible 10 million dollar compensatory damage verdict and a 5 million punitive damage verdict the verdict is excessive as a matter of law in light of the evidence and law and should be set aside i I think they're being a little bit too a little, a little too picky and pedantic about their closing argument mentioning the 2016 stuff. I think even if the 2016 wasn't included and you're only looking at the time periods that, you know, she was being um, sued for, I still think that 10 million was okay because, you know, we all know how much Johnny Depp was making on Pirates 4 and how much he was probably going to make if there was a Pirates 5, right? The verdict is excessive. I already read that. Further evidencing the confusion resulting from Mr. Depp's effort to relitigate the 2016 domestic relations matter without the truth of the UK judgment, the jury's dueling verdicts are inconsistent and recon irreconcilable. Yeah, I don't know. It just feels like I'm not a lawyer or anything, but it just feels like they're really just stretching here. Or is it stretching, grasping at straws? The finding of defamation against Ms. Heard with $2 million award is inconsistent with the finding of defamation with Mr. Depp with a $15 million award. Now, remember, um, one of the jurors said that the reason why Ms. Heard got the $2 million because there was one juror on there who, you know, had sympathy for Amber Heard and didn't really um, find that Mr. Waldman made those statements, um, I guess, like in good faith. And there was like malice and uh, it was defamation behind it. So there was only one juror. If we're going to go with the other juror's word. In face of these inconsistent verdicts, the judgment should be set aside and a new trial ordered. At trial, Mr. Depp proceeded solely on the defamation by implication theory, abandoning any claims that Ms. Hurd's statements were actually false. But where, as here, A, the statements are true on their face, which Mr. Mr. Depp never challenged. B, the plaintiff is a public figure, which Mr. Depp has conceded he is. C, the matter of the op-ed is on matters of public concern, which this court earlier determined as a matter of law. The First Amendment prohibits claim by implication. While this appears to be the case of first impression in Virginia, dicta in our courts and holdings in our other courts in similar circumstances warrant applying this doctrine to this case, setting aside the judgment and dismissing the complaint. Mr. Depp never challenged the fact that Ms. Heard did not write the title of the op-ed, one of the three defamatory statements comprising Mr. Depp's defamation claims. Instead, Mr. Depp contended Ms. Heard's tweet of a link to the article the following day constituted actionable republication. And if you remember, um, Amber Heard and her lawyers, they were trying to dismiss the case after Johnny Depp and his team presented his side of the story. And they were basically saying, hey, you know, the tweeted, it doesn't constitute as, you know, something that you can sue um, Ms. Heard for. But Judge Penny was like, no, 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 no. When you tweet it, it does. In addition to establishing a dangerous precedent, suggesting anyone tweeting or retweeting an article or link can be independently liable for the content, this interpretation is beyond the reach of Virginia law on republication because nothing in Ms. Heard's tweet constituted a legally enforceable republication. This count, <laughs> this court should be dismissed. I feel like they're just arguing the same thing again. They argued this already and Judge Penny was like, nope. Since the damages award does not separate out of three separate statements, in the event the court does not dismiss all three counts, the judgment should be set aside and a new trial ordered on remaining claims. For the jury to find Ms. Heard demonstrated actual malice, Mr. Depp was required to establish the time the op-ed was published. Ms. Heard did not believe she was abused or that she had doubts about whether she was abused. But Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard did not believe she was abused. <laughs> Instead, the evidence overwhelmingly supported Ms. Heard. Overwhelmingly, eh? I believe she was a victim of abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. Therefore, Mr. Depp did not meet the legal requirements for actual malice and the verdict should be set aside. Next, Mr. Depp improperly relied on time barred and judicially privileged statements as the basis for his defamation by innuendo claims. Although actionable innuendo must be drawn from the four corners of the document, in this case, it could only be drawn for the reference in the article to Ms. Heard obtaining the DV TRO against Mr. Depp in 2016. This warrant setting aside the verdict on all three of the defamation counts. Finally, the information on the jury panel list appears to be inconsistent with the identity and demographics of one of the jurors. Juror number 15 was apparently born in 1970, not 1945. 25 years difference, guys. 
as reported to and relied upon by the parties, including Ms. Hurd, in selecting a jury panel. Given the requirements for verification of each juror, it appears the identity of the juror was not verified. It is unclear if juror number 15 was in fact ever summoned for jury duty or qualified to serve on the panel. This warrants an investigation by this court to determine if the juror was in fact summoned or whether the due process rights of the parties were bypassed. Depending upon the results of the investigation, this may justify setting aside the verdict in its entirety and setting this matter for a new trial. Um, so I was reading some articles about this, um, how, you know, if it was true, how it could potentially happen. So let's say you have someone that's born in 1945, father, and then the father has a son born in 1970. Maybe they share the same names and maybe they don't have the, you know, the numbers that accompanies it when you have like a child that's named after you. So it is possible maybe the child got the jury summons that was meant for his dad and he thought that he was serving it for himself. Or, you know, like if we're going to go with some, the conspiracy that Elaine is throwing out here, it is possible that someone could have been like, oh, you know, I'm not on jury duty, but I'm going to steal, you know, your your jury summons and I'm going to pretend to be this juror that's supposed to be serving. But I don't know. I, I feel like while it is possible for me, I think it's just more like maybe a clerical error or just some honest misunderstanding. But of course, you know, they're going to do a whole... Maybe, maybe they'll do a whole investigation of this and we'll find out. But yeah, I don't know. Like, it's like, oh, I really want to be a juror for Johnny Depp. I don't know. I feel like ugh, eh, it's possible, but eh, I don't think I, I don't think it's the case. Um, argument one, the damages awarded by the jury are unsupported by the evidence and the law. The jury returned a verdict in the amount of 10 million in compensatory damages and 5 million in punitive damages. The punitive damages amount was reduced to statutory cap of 350 k These damage awards were not unsupported by evidence presented at trial and cannot be upheld as a matter of law. Under Virginia Code, la 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 la, where damages awarded are too small or too excessive, courts have the authority to order a new trial on all issues or solely on the issue of damages or remittiture. While as a general rule, a trial court should not disturb a jury award that has been fairly rendered and based upon competent evidence. Courts have a duty to correct a verdict that plainly appears to be unfair or would result in a miscarriage of judgment. Circumstances which compel setting aside a jury verdict include a damage award that is so excessive that it shocks the conscience of the court, creating the impression that the jury was influenced by passion, corruption, or prejudice. Oh, man. That the jury misconceived or misunderstood the facts of the law the award is so out of proportion to the injury suffered as to suggest that it is not the product of a fair and impartial decision. Citation here. Setting aside a verdict as excessive under these conditions is an exercise of inherent discretion of the trial court. Here, the jury's determination of $10 million in compensatory damage is excessive as a matter of law, as there's no evidence to support the verdict. Mr. Depp was limited to damages from court uh, from December, sorry, damages from December 18, 2018, the date of Ms. Hurd's op-ed, through November 2nd, 2020, the date the court ruled in the UK that Mr. Depp had committed at least 12 acts of domestic uh, of DV, including SV at times, in causing Ms. Hurt to cause for her life. The court, during opening statements in response to Mr. Depp's objection, prohibited Ms. Hurd from telling the story from the Sun article, which was published in April 2018, nearly eight months after the op-ed. The trial in July 2020, during the limited period Mr. Depp was able to claim damages, the complaint filed with Mr. Depp in June 2018 alleging irreparable damage to his reputation, defense exhibit, the three-week three trial, three trial of Mr. Depp's libel claims, ensuing publicity surrounding the trial or the UK judgment, 129-page uh, 129 uh, document. This is the, uh, the judgment. Um, he wrote a 129 pages. After many of the Mr. Depp's witnesses testified, the court then allowed Ms. Heard to raise, but not to admit into evidence, the Sun article, the fact of the trial, the publicity surrounding the trial, but still not the UK judgment. In an effort to prevent the UK judgment from coming to evidence, Mr. Depp represented he would not attempt to claim any damages after November 2nd, 2020. Notwithstanding Mr. Depp's reputation, he would not attempt to claim any damages other than the period December 18, 2018, through November 2nd, 2020. Mr. Depp made no attempt to limit his damages and his counsels in closing made clear that they were seeking damages from May 27, 2016. I don't know if they were really seeking damages. I think they were just mentioning it just to make their closing argument more profound. Are they not allowed to do that? The did Ms. Hurt saw it and attained a DVTRO, which we know that. This is highly prejudicial to Ms. Hurd, necessarily creating confusion for the jury and resulting 10 million compensatory and 5 million punitive damages uh, awards, 
reflect the jury's belief that it was restoring Mr. Depp's reputation based on Ms. Hurd's initial filing of May 2016 DVTRO, as Mr. Depp's counsel requested in openings and closing. So if this was, I, I didn't listen to the whole opening statement. Um, I start listening when I think Johnny Depp's sister went up, uh, Christy Dembrowski. Let's say they mentioned this in opening. Why didn't the lawyers raise this with the judge? Or maybe they already did. And the judge was like, nope, we're good. This alone justifies setting aside the verdict and ordering a new trial. Mr. Depp presents no evidence of any pecuniary damages suffered in the limited December 18, 2018 through November 2nd, 2020 timeframe as a result of the op-ed. There is no evidence of any projects or lost commercial opportunities because of the op-ed. Moreover, Mr. Depp cannot demonstrate any reputational damages from the op-ed because the evidence was that Mr. Depp lost nothing less than everything when Ms. Hurd obtained a DVTRO against him. And that there were two years of just constant worldwide talk about Mr. Depp being this wife beater before the op-ed was even published, including the Sun wife beater article. In addition, any reputational damages from the op-ed, which never mentioned Mr. Depp's name, will not have been non-existent or at best nominal compared to the Sun article. The lawsuit brought by Mr. Depp, the publicity over Mr. Depp's lawsuit against the Sun in the UK, and the subsequent trial and the judgment rendered against Mr. Depp. Moreover, the exclusion of the UK judgment necessarily prevents any reasonable or competent assessments of any damages, including reputational damages as well as credibility of Mr. Depp in asserting damages. All right, pause. Let me drink some water. There is no way a jury can determine any level of damage to Mr. Depp from the op-ed without taking into consideration all potential alternative causes of damages, much less an overriding one. Bought on a Mr. Depp election to file a libel suit in a form of his choosing, claiming irreparable damages to his reputation from the Sun article. There can be no damages reasonably tied to the op-ed, much less $10 million. It is excessive as a matter of law and should be set aside. So what were we doing for the past six weeks of the trial? Were we just not doing anything? A. There's no evidence of pecuniary damages from the op-ed. All right, let's see what they say. Taking the evidence in the light most favorable to Mr. Depp, there is no evidence upon which the jury could have reasonably relied to determine that Mr. Depp suffered any pecuniary losses because of the op-ed. While Mr. Depp asserted he lost Pirate 6 because of the op-ed, there is no evidence upon the jury can rely on to reach such a conclusion. Mr. Depp did not have a contract for Pirate 6. I remember that, I forgot who testified. Uh, they said it was, it was basically a verbal uh, contract and having a verbal contract is typical of Hollywood, especially when you've done other films before. So there was like a verbal contract and then afterwards they would draw out like a real contract. There was media coverage that Mr. Depp would not be in a Pirate 6 as of October 25th, 2018, two months before the op-ed. I do remember that article. I think they said that, but I remember, I, I, I didn't think it was that strong of a, of a comment, but we have to look it up again. Mr. Depp's agent testified that it'd be very likely that Mr. Depp would not be in the Pirate 6 as of fall 2018. And Mr. Depp testified that he would not have agreed to play a role in Pirate 6 for 300 million and a million all pockets. I love how Elaine loves this quote. Moreover, the Disney corporate representative testified that Pirate 6 is still a project possibly in development at the studio as of present. Um, I remember the person that they had to testify on behalf of Disney and that person, um, it seems like everything was kind of like above their pay grade and they just weren't really sure. At least that's the impression that I got. Uh, and that Disney would not entertain paying Mr. Depp 300 million, provide him with a million pockets. Yeah, no, no, no shit. Disney's representative further testified that she did not know if Pirate 6 would ever be made. Yeah, she didn't know. She didn't say it wasn't going to be made. While Mr. Depp agent testified to a deal of Mr. Depp Depp for Pirate 6 for $22.5 million, yet also admitting there's no writing memorializing the supposed deal, he said that Mr. Depp would not be paid until the film shoots. Mr. Wiggum's belief there existed a contract was based on his understanding that Tracy Jacobs, Mr. Depp's early agent, had negotiated the deal. However, Tracy Jacobs testified that there's no deal negotiated, no commitment from Disney that Mr. Depp would be in Pirate 6 while she represented Mr. Depp, which was until October 2016. Since the film has never been shot, let alone ever written, and was not by November 2nd, 2020, the day Mr. Depp's uh, damages are cut off, it will be impossible for Mr. Depp to claim pirates for pirates damages for Pirates 6, six. <laughs> yet Mr. Depp continued to claim this at trial. Most importantly, there's no evidence that Ms. the op-ed had anything to do with whether Mr. Depp will be in Pirate 6. The Disney corporate representative testified that no decision maker within Disney has ever said that Disney would not cast Mr. Depp for Pirate 6 or any other Disney projects because of Ms. Hurd's op-ed. 
In fact, while Disney had internal emails commenting on negative publicity relating to Mr. Depp, including the UK trial and judgment, it had nothing in his files even referring to the op-ed, much less a copy of the op-ed. Even Mr. Marks, Mr. Depp's expert, acknowledged the article published three days after the UK trial, indicating that Mr. Depp was out of any further Pirates franchise. If the jury based any aspects of its award on Pirate 6, this would be contrary to the evidence, prejudicially impacted by Ms. Heard being pre prevented from introducing the November 2nd, 2020 UK judgment, or the article three days later, purely speculative and was effectively prohibited because Mr. Depp was limited to damages before November 2nd, 2020. Nor is there any evidence Mr. Depp lost any opportunities because of the op-ed. There's no evidence of any of the films being lost because of the op-ed. Mr. Wiggum testified that Mr. Depp did not have any studio films between December 2018 and October 2020, but he did not testify that it was the op-ed that had Mr. Depp to lose any opportunities. Instead, Mr. Carino, Mr. Depp's other agent, testified that the publicity surrounding litigation was harmful to Mr. Depp's career. Mr. Depp filed a lawsuit against the son and Mr. Wooden in June 2018 and against Ms. Heard in March 2019. Mr. Wiggum testified that a great deal of publicity surrounding the UK trial and Mr. Depp had not cast in any film since the UK trial. There's also no evidence of any endorsements that Mr. Depp lost or did not receive because of the op-ed. In fact, Mr. Depp still had an endorsement deal with Dior, which he had since 2015. Yeah, Dior was um, very loyal to him. There is absolutely no evidence demonstrating the op-ed caused Mr. Depp to suffer any financial losses and Mr. Depp did not testify to any lost opportunities or financial damages. B. The jury's compensatory and punitive damage awards were excessive as a matter of law. Given that the jury did not or could not award Mr. Depp damages for any financial or pecuniary losses based on the evidence presented at trial, the only damages the jury could have possibly awarded to Mr. Depp were reputational damages. Even though reputational damages are not are non-pecuniary, a jury must still award damages that resulted only from a defendant's wrong and not from other causes. Do you guys remember how Elaine, Ben Chu, they had to stay behind after both sides presented the case, after the rebuttals, they both had to stay behind and write the jury uh, verdict form. It was like, hey, like this is what you're gonna make decisions based off of. Like wouldn't have wouldn't all that have already been clear in the jury verdict form? Just saying. Moreover, reputational damage cannot be used to punish a defendant for all the negative publicity that plaintiffs have received separate from the alleged defamation. Thomas V. Seema's la 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 la. But it's precisely what happened here and it was compounded by the exclusion of evidence in the UK trial. Because I feel like everything they're alleging right now and all the things that they're bringing up, uh, this should have happened pre-trial or during trial. There's the uh, OC. Oh, Mr. Depp is not entitled to damages for any conduct prior to the op-ed. There's no evidence of damage to Mr. Depp's reputation caused by Ms. Heard's op-ed. Instead, Mr. Depp testified that damage to his reputation was when Ms. Heard obtained the DVTRO, for which he cannot be compensated. Mr. Depp began his testimony by informing the jury that he brought the case because six years ago, Ms. Heard made some quite heinous and disturbing and brought these certain criminal acts against me that, that were not based in any species of truth. Mr. Depp then continues testimony by describing how the accusations from the DVTRO in 2016 spread to the media. This news of this, her accusation has sort of permeated the industry and then made its way through media and social media, became quite global, let's say, fact, if you will. I felt it was my responsibility to stand up, not only for myself in that instance, but stand up for my children, who at the time were 14 and 16, and so they were in high school. And I thought it was diabolical that my children would have to go to school and have their friends or people in the school approach them with the infamous People magazine cover with Ms. Heard with the dark bruise on her face. And then it just kept the, it kept multiplying. It kept getting bigger and bigger. Mr. Depp emphasized that his reputation has been damaged for six years, well before Ms. Heard's op-ed. I mean, isn't it okay for him to bring that up though? Because it did happen and they have, he has to bring that up. Like, oh, this all began because of this. Um, on the jury verdict form, that Elaine helped craft it, it would say, hey, you know, don't don't take in consideration to whatever happened before the op-ed, take in consideration between the time period that we're talking about. Mr. Jeff emphasized that his reputation has been damaged for six years, well before Ms. Hurt's op-ed. So it was my responsibility, I felt, to not only attempt to clear my name for the sake of, well, for many reasons, I wanted to clear my children of this hard thing that they were having to read about their father, which was untrue. It has really taken this six full years and been six years of trying times. It's been strange when one day you're Cinderella, so to speak, and in 0 0.6 seconds, you're Quasimodo. <laughs> What's wrong with Quasimodo? <laughs> Mr. Depp's testimony clearly establishes that the damage to his reputation occurred in 2016 and was not related to the op-ed. 
I feel like nowadays Quasimodo would definitely be accepted. I know back then people were like, "Ew, Quasimodo," but you know nowadays like, "Oh, Quasimodo, poor guy, the underdog." All right. And this was not isolated evidence. Mr. Depp also testified that the public became aware of the DVTRO in May 2016, and the bad news about him was multiplying and multiplying and multiplying throughout the media, throughout social media as well. So-called sort of strike media or whatever. And I was a bit taken back. They were abuse allegations. And there were alcohol and there was drugs and violence. And it was just, it was already right then and there before my eyes spinning out of control. Mr. Depp testified that when Ms. Hurd obtained the DVTRO, he lost nothing less nothing less than everything. Because when the allegations were made and when the allegations were rapidly circling the globe, people telling that I was drunken, cocaine-fueled menace who beat women, suddenly in my 50s, it was over, you know, you're done. This negative publicity in 2016 included articles from TMZ and People Magazine that showed photos of the A alleged by Ms. Hurd, which Mr. Depp introduced into evidence in this case. The negative publicity about Mr. Depp before Ms. Hurd's op-ed was also, also included headlines such as and these are all the articles that uh, talks about Johnny Depp. Oh, God, what happened here? Why are, you, why are you blurry? So they're basically kind of butt mad that Mr. Depp. <laughs> why is he Mr. Depp? They're pretty butt mad that Johnny Depp brought up, and the lawyers as well, brought up the uh, DVTRO and anything that happened before the op-ed. But it's like, well, if they weren't allowed to bring it up, then that would have been something that they would have brought to the judge's attention and she would have, you know, been like, oh, hey, you can't bring this up or you could bring it up. But I mean, I just don't see how they were able to, how, how did they think that Johnny Depp was going to go through this trial without bringing up all the other stuff that happened to him? You know, that's basically like the, it, it sets the foundation for like, okay, this is what happened. And this is the time period that I'm going to sue for because this is when things really went down for Johnny Depp. It was when the op-ed came out. Mr. Depp admitted that these articles were not because of Ms. Hurd's op-ed, but rather all start with Ms. Hurd's going to, going direct to the court to get a TRO, which is with the bruise on her face and the paparazzi. This is sort of the beginning of the ball rolling down the hill and getting momentum. After six weeks of trial, Mr. Depp went up to the stand and reiterated this testimony to the jury, saying that Ms. Hurd's action in May 2016 changed everything. Also, did did Elaine or Roddenborn, I don't know which one was the, uh, the one that was doing the objections, but... Why didn't they just object to all of this when it was happening? He again did not say that it was the op-ed that damaged him, but the accusation from May 2016, claiming that I have spoken up what I've been carrying my back reluctantly for tw for six years. Mr. Depp had only rely on his testimony to claim damages from May 2016 forward. Doug Banya, an expert hired by Mr. Depp, was asked to analyze the impact of this, the allegation of domestic abuse made by Ms. Hurd as it relates to her 2016 restraining order, and then asked to also analyze the publication of the alleged abuse in her 2018 Washington Post op-ed. Mr. Banya testified that his analysis showed that prior to 2016 in the allegations, the abuse allegation, Mr. Depp was not portrayed in negative commentation. Then after the 2016 mark, you know, the majority of these results turned to negative things about the A allegations. And then even more so after the op-ed, there seems some kind of theme or flavor of not only the A allegations, but this drinking and drug use. Mr. Banya admitted that this, his analysis cannot separate out Mr. Depp's reputation was impacted from the op-ed versus how it was impacted for when Ms. Hurd filed for divorce. This means, as Mr. Banya admitted, that Mr. Depp's experts cannot say that Mr. Depp's reputation or public image was affected by the op-ed. In fact, Mr. Banya testified that Mr. Depp's Q scores, both positive and negative, actually improved after Ms. Hurd's op-ed, meaning his reputation and public image actually improved after the op-ed into 2020. Ah, God, I'm going to have to... I, I wonder if they are just... I wonder if they're misrepresenting Doug Banya's statement. Man, I, I wish I could read the transcript. Because I, I remember Doug Banya talking about the Q scores and stuff, but I don't know if I remember it alluding to this, that his reputation in public image imp improved after the op-ed. <laughs> Finally, Mr. Depp's counsel improperly emphasized to the jury that it could not find damages based on Ms. Hurd's obtaining the DVTRO. Counsel began Mr. Depp's closing argument not by discussing the op-ed, but by stating on May 27, 2016, Ms. Hurd walked to the courthouse into L.A., California to get a no-notice ex parte restraining order against Mr. Depp, and by doing so, ruined his life by falsely telling the world that she was a survivor of D.A. in the hands of Mr. Depp. Today, on May 27, 2020, exactly six years later, oh, this is Camille Vasquez's statement, we asked you to get Mr. Depp his life back by telling the world that Mr. Depp is not the A Mr. Hurd, uh, Ms. Hurd said he is and hold Ms. Hurd accountable for her lies. Counsel for Mr. Depp then went on to tell the jury that Ms. Hurd seeking DVTRO was not based on truth and was instead designed to ruin Mr. Depp. 
when she walked into court six years ago today on May 27, 2016, to get a DV restraining order against Mr. Depp, she did so in front of the paparazzi with a mark on her face. The evidence presented this trial demonstrates that Ms. Heard didn't just want a divorce, she wanted to ruin him. Like Mr. Depp's testimony, the evidence offered throughout the case was not isolated remarks, but permeated the entire closing that Ms. Heard should be held responsible for seeking the DVTRO in 2016. Yeah, but do you also remember the closing argument? If you guys remember Ben Roddenborn's closing argument, it was like, if you don't believe Amber Heard, you basically don't believe any victims that come forward. Uh, I don't know. I, I just remember it was a lot of guilt tripping, and it just didn't sit right. It was like, if you rule against Amber Heard, you're basically telling all victims that they will not be hurt, that they will not be believed. But you know, in this situation, Amber Heard is a different story because a lot of evidence came out that proves that she lied. In quotations, in parentheses, that's when his life ended. That was six years ago to this day when Ms. Heard on May 27, 2016, walked into the court with her public with her publicist, Jody Gottlieb, having tipped off TMZ with an alleged mark on her face to accuse Mr. Depp of, of A. It is about Mr. Depp's reputation and freeing him from prison in which he has lived for the last six years. It is six years to the day. You heard from Mr. Depp yesterday that he was carrying these outlandish, outrageous stories on his back pretty stoically and living with them for six years and waiting to be able to bring the truth back. The emphasis of this closing was clear. Mr. Depp was asking the jury to compensate him for actions that occurred on May 27, 2016, Actions to which he had no right to damages. This is improper and calls for the court to set aside the verdict. Oh, man, I, I feel like that is stretching. Eee. All right, Elaine. The court, says that the, the court has a substantial concern that the jury's decision was a result of an attempt by them not merely to compensate but to punish the defendant for her remarks about a personnel matter on a public airwaves. Moreover, it appears they intended to punish her for all negative publicity that a plaintiff received, not just the effects of one interview in March of 2016. Tw uh, D. Mr. Depp is not entitled to damages for alternative causes, including the Sun publication and suing the litigation brought by Mr. Depp, the UK trial and surrounding publicity, <gasps> and the UK judgment. The evidence demonstrates that any damages caused to Mr. Depp after the op-ed was not because of the op-ed. There were numbers of alternative casualties. The most significant was surrounding the Sun's April 2018 publication in the UK for the article by Dan Wooden entitled, How Can J.K. Rawlings Be Genuinely Happy Casting Wife Eater Johnny Depp in the New Fantastic Films Beast? And the ensuing lawsuit, trial, and judgment. Mr. Depp brought a lawsuit against the Sun and Mr. Wooden on June 13, 2018, six months before Ms. Hurd's op-ed, because Mr. Depp wanted to clear his name. The exact same quest repeated by Mr. Depp and his counsel throughout the trial. The UK litigation resulted in a three-week London uh, trial in London in the summer of 2020. As Mr. Depp's agent testified, there was an enormous amount of press surrounding the trial. In fact, Mr. Banya's analysis found in the press surrounding Mr. Depp after Ms. Hurt's op-ed did not mention the op-ed at all, but instead were about Mr. Depp's trial in the UK, which included the following headlines. All right, so these headlines um, talks about the disturbing text messages, so let's burn Amber. Hollywood waiting for the explosive Depp trial, Depp versus Hurt, all the nasty bits. Depp claims that there are lies. Mr. Depp's agent testified that after the trial and these headlines in July 2020, Mr. Depp has made no more films. Mr. Depp cannot, as a matter of law, be compensated for any injuries caused by anything associated with the Sun publication, the UK lawsuit in the trial, and the UK judgment. Yet, Mr. Doug's expert, Mr. Banya, could not separate how Mr. Depp's reputation was impacted from the op-ed versus the publicity surrounding Mr. Depp UK litigation. Nor did Mr. Depp present any other evidence that was able to separate any damages Mr. Depp reportedly incurred from the op-ed versus what he sustained from the UK litigation. Finally, Mr. Depp claimed in his testimony that he had been damaged for the past six years, including through this jury verdict. Mr. Depp's counsel also argued in the closing, you heard from Mr. Depp yesterday that he was carrying this outlandish, outrageous stories on his back stoically. Okay, so this quote again. This completely defied Mr. Depp's representation to the court that Mr. Depp was only going to claim damages from December 18, 2018 through November, 20, November 2, 2020. It is eminently unfair and prejudicial for the jury to be told repeatedly that Mr. Depp was damaged for six years up to the present, while Mr. Depp represented to the court that it was not claiming such damages. The prejudice is exponentially increased because Ms. Heard was denied the ability to deduce the evidence that Mr. Depp's lawsuit against Mr. Sun and Mr. Wooden resulted in an extensive 129-page judicial finding that Mr. Depp committed 12 acts of domestic violence, 
against Ms. Heard, including SV, that also caused Ms. Heard to fear for her life. Um, the jury's verdict as the damage should be set aside. I don't know, honestly, like we knew about the UK verdict. The people that are watching this, you know, with us on social media, um, people who, you know, weren't the jury. And even knowing the UK verdict, we still thought that she was still lying because of the witnesses that came out, uh, the wit the witnesses and the evidence. So I, I think even if the jury knew about the UK verdict, I don't think it would have swayed them. Um, Amber Heard's evidence was really, really weak uh, compared to the evidence that Johnny Depp and his team presented. E, Virginia case law supports setting aside damages judgments that are excessive. There has been several cases been found damages to be excessive in defamation cases, which are instructive here. While each case must be determined by its own fact, it is nevertheless true that the verdicts of other juries have been approved by the courts. Represent the common or average judgment of mankind as a proper recovery in such cases. Citation here. Finding a verdict of $10 million to be excessive in multiple times the amount of any other damages award for defamation in Virginia. Quote here. For example, in case here, the Virginia Supreme Court sustained a remitter of $900,000 from, from a million compensatory damage for the defamation arising under the publication of the front page article of Richmond Times Dispatch, which reported on complaints about plaintiff's performance as a teacher. While the court affirmed the judge that the teacher was defamed, it held an award of a million clearly to have been excessive and that the evidence does not demonstrate the trial court abused its discretion in reducing the award to 100K. In another trial case here, in another court case here, the jury awarded compensatory damages of 100000 for publication of an advertisement accusing plaintiff of racism in the campus newspaper in the university where plaintiff was a professor. The Virginia Supreme Court held that 100K damages bore no relationship to the law sustained by the plaintiff. The verdict of 100K is so out of proportion to the damage sustained as to be excessive as a matter of law. As Finna points out, more experienced no physical manifestation of any emotional distress. distress. Moreover, he sought no medical attention for any condition resulting from the publication. In addition, no, <laughs> I can't read right now. In addition, there's no evidence that Moore's standing with his peers was diminished as a result of libel. Actually, the evidence showed that Moore continues to be held in high esteem amongst his community of friends and colleagues. Similarly, is it similarly? Mr. Depp cannot point to damages sustained from the op-ed as opposed to other unrelated events. The 10 million verdict is completely out of proportion with anything even remotely related to the op-ed, especially in light of the Sun article, the lawsuit filed with Mr. Depp, the ensuing trial, and admitted negative publicity that the adverse UK judgment in the same time frame. Two circuit court cases are also instructive. In different court case, the court reduced the damage to award 350k for defamation to 750 or 75k. The court found that the award was excessive because on March 8, 2016, when the defendant made her defamatory statement to Wavy TV. Plaintiff had already been unflattering portrayed in many articles criticizing him as a Virginia pilot. As described above and admitted by Mr. Depp, he was unflatteringly he had been unflatteringly portrayed for at least two years before Ms. Hurd's op-ed. In addition, the court in Thomas had a substantial concern that the jury's decision was a result of an attempt by them not merely to compensate but to punish the defendant for remarks about a personnel matter on the public airwaves. Moreover, it appears that he they intended to punish her for all the negative publicity that plaintiff had received, not just the effects of one interview. Here, the jury award of $10 million is not commensurate with damage purportedly causing Ms. Hurd's op-ed, but rather to punish her for all the alleged harm caused to Mr. Depp for the past six years, beginning with May 27, 2016 DVTRO, which Mr. Depp was not entitled to receive damages. The same is true for the $5 million punitive damages that were obviously a sense to punish Ms. Hurd for something far beyond the op-ed. Finally, in another court case, the court found an award of damages of $10 million in defamation case to be excessive and reduced the award to $1 million. There was a broadcast corporation, though, its TV station aired inaccurate information regarding plaintiff's arrest for conspiracy to distribute cocaine, namely that law enforcement officers found 50 grams of crack and 500 grams of powder cocaine at his residence and businesses. Despite the finding of defamation, the court significantly reduced the damages award because it found that the defendant could not be held responsible only for those injuries by the defamatory portion of the defendant's broadcast, not for the losses or injuries sustained from the attendant arrest, prosecution, and forfeiture proceedings, or from the newspaper accounts and the accurate proportions portions of the television broadcast internet publication reporting those events. Likewise, the defendants could not be held liable for creating any of the emotional, mental health, or physical symptoms deemed to have predated the defamatory broadcast. Notwithstanding these limitation conditions, the jury awarded the plaintiff $10 million 
an amount more than sufficient to compensate him for his injuries of any sort whatsoever. The most plausible explanation size for the award is that the jury misperceived the law and the instructions and instead set out to punish the defendant in addition to compensating the plaintiff. The same is true here, where it appears that the jury was punishing Ms. Hurd for everything that happened to Mr. Jeff from 2016 forward. I mean, I, I even though that was not supposed to be the scope, I do think that she should have been punished for 2016 forward. In fact, Mr. Depp's closing asked the jury to clear his name from everything from 2016 forward, which the, cur- the court in Sheckler held was error. Holding the excessive award is supported by the review of the plaintiff's counsel remarks in summation. Instead of asking for compens- compensation for proven losses, plaintiff's counsel, I don't know why it's like getting more and more blurry, uh, without objection, asked the jury to require the defendant television station to pay an enormous sum of money to clear Mr. Sheckler's good name. Mr. Depp's counsel asked the jury to give Mr. Depp his life back by referring not to the op-ed, but by referring back to May 27, 2016. On May 27, 2016. Okay, this is the same quote. Damages in this case cannot be based on actions from 2016 or any damage that Mr. Depp suffered because of the trial in the UK. But the jury's 10 million judgment for their reputational damages clearly show that it is what the jury did. Such an award is excessive by law and should be set aside. The verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are inconsistent with the therefore should be set aside. The Virginia Supreme Court has held that the jury verdicts are irreconcilably inconsistent, cannot stand. Insert court case here. In this case, the Supreme Court instructed that a new trial was necessary when portions of the jury verdict are irreconcilable, holding that the jury verdict was inconsistent, which in such form requires new trial on all issues. So again, I'm not a lawyer or a judge, and I'm not familiar with these cases, but people who are, um, they may be familiar with these cases, and they may be able to break it down more. Um, because, you know, it is possible that Elaine might be citing these cases, but it may not even pertain to what she's trying to prove. They could just be picking and choosing and not really representing it um, in good faith. <laughs> you know, you, sometimes lawyers be doing that. Here are the jury's verdict in favor of Mr. Depp as to his defamation claims and in favor of Ms. Hurd as to her claim of defamation are inherently and irreconcilably inconsistent and therefore cannot stand. The verdict found that Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Hurd at any time, while at the same time necessary found that Ms. Hurd did not lie about being a victim of DA. And in particular, A, that occurred on May 21, 2016. These findings are, are entirely inconsistent. In overruling Ms. Heard's demurrer, this court held that a statement Amber Heard, I spoke up against uh, SV. This is her um, op-ed quote. These are the three quotes that she was being sued for. All convey the same meaning, that Mr. Depp, A, Ms. Heard. Uh, 3 27 20 letter opinion at 4 5 emphasis added in reaching that conclusion the court held the inference could be made based on the events surrounding the party's divorce including the allegations from may 2016 this holding means that the jury to have found mr depp's favor as his defamation claims it necessarily had to find that mr depp did not a miss hurt at any time including may 21 2016 conversely when this court overruled mr depp's demur to miss her's counterclaim it held that the statement made on April 27, 2020 about the May 21st, 2016 incident implies that Ms. Hurd lied and perjured herself when she appeared before court in 2016 to obtain a temporary restraining order against Mr. Depp. Moreover, it implies that she lied about being a victim of DA. One four twenty one letter opinion at 6, emphasis added, this holding means that for the jury to find Ms. Hurd's favor, Ms. Hurd's favor as her defamation claim, it is necessary to find that Ms. Hurd did not lie about being a victim of DA, and in particular, the incident occurred on May 21st, 2016. Mr. Depp himself acknowledged before the trial that a party's defamation claims are mirror images of each other. This case is unique. It involves two essentially mirror image defamation claims asserted against the only two people who truly know whether the statements or issues are true or false. If Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Hurd, she indisputably knows her claim that he did is false. If Mr. Depp did not A, Ms. Hurd, during their brief of marriage, she knows that Mr. Walman's statements calling Ms. Hurd is a liar or false. As Mr. Depp's own brief makes clear, the party's claims against each other necessarily implies that Mr. Depp did not or did not A, Ms. Hurd. By finding defamation against both parties, the jury necessarily found that Mr. Depp did not A, Ms. Hurd, and at the same time, Mr. Depp did not A, Ms. Hurd. Thus, the verdicts are irreconcilably inconsistent, therefore cannot stand. At a minimum, the jury's finding in favor of Ms. Hur necessarily precludes the finding of actual malice by her with respect to Mr. Depp's claim. Three, the First Amendment bars recovery for defamation or implications when the statements are issue, at issue are true at their face and involves a public figure or matters of public concern. The Supreme Court of Virginia has never decided whether facially true statements can support a claim of defamation by implication when they involve a public figure or matters of public concern. 
in Pendleton v. Newsom. However, the court signaled that this doctrine does not imply does not apply at these circumstances. There, the court distinguished Chapman v. Knight Rider Inc., where the Fourth Circuit held that the ish- speech at issue did not import a defamatory implication from the facts of Pendleton reasoning. In Chapman, the court considered a libel claim in which the defendants were members of the press, the plaintiffs were public figures, and the subject matter touched on matters of private concern. Controversy regarding involvement of American troops in the Persian Gulf War. In these circumstances, the court held the constitutional protection of the press reaches its apogee. Here, by contrast, the plaintiff was not a public figure. The defendants were employed by the government agencies and were not official. Oh, God, that is blurry. <laughs> but were not officials generally known. The publicity attending the subject matter lasted only a few days, and the freedom of the press is no way impacted. I feel like I'm at the doctor's office right now. Like, A or B, one or two. Pendleton, 290 VA. Um, this reasoning indicates that defamation by implication warrants different treatment when the speech at issue involves public figures or affairs. It also demonstrates that whether the First Amendment permits recovery in those circumstances is a question of first impression in Virginia. Several jurisdictions have held defamation by implication is not recognized as a viable cause of action when the statement at issue concerns public figures or matters of public concern. Uh, let's see. See, Johnson v. Propera is actionable only if the statements regard a private individual and private matters. McDonald v. Broadcorp, statement about a public figure that is true on his face cannot support claim for defamation by implication. Clements v. WHDHTV, finding the plaintiff as a public officer is a public figure. He is not entitled to recover the portion of his claim alleging defamation by implication. Andrews v. Stalling, the factual statements are true and therefore the implication of misrepresentation cannot constitutionally serve as a predicate for the defamation complaint by the public official regarding a matter of public concern. Pietrofesso v. DPI, Inc., uh, the trial court did not err in concluding as a matter of law that if allegedly libelous statements are true, there can be no libel by innuendo of a public figure. D. Falco v. Anderson, we here adopt the view that there is no libel by innuendo of a public figure where the challenge communication is true. Quoting Strata v. Con newspaper, also see Garrison v. Louisiana, truth may not be the subject of either civil or criminal sanctions where discussion of public affairs is concerned. C. Stevens v. Iowa newspapers, describing diverging authority on this question and concluding public figure can maintain suit for defamation by implication. Other courts permit actions for defamation by implication by the public figure only when the inference arises from the omission of material facts in the challenge miscommunication or in the challenge communication. The Strata v. Connecticut newspapers. Libel law cannot impose damages for injuries to reputation arising from their press report of materially true facts about public figure on the matter of public interest and without material factual omissions. Similarly, courts that permit public figures to recover the information by implication generally define this tort as occurring when a publication, one, juxtaposes a series of facts so as to imply a defamatory connection between them, or two, creates a defamatory implication by omitting facts. Uh, so it's a case here. The touchstone of implied defamation ca- claims is an artificial juxtaposition of two true statements or a matter of mission of facts that would render the challenge statements non-defamatory. Three rationales underlying these decisions are in- instructive. First, precluding liability for factually true statements about public figures or affairs is a corollary to the protection of false statements published without malice. Here's a quote here. Truthful statements which can carry defamatory implication can be actionable. However, that is only true in the case of private citizens and private affairs. Even false statements about the public officials are constitutionally protected unless known to be false or printed with a reckless disregard for the truth. New York Times Company v. Sullivan, Supra. It surely follows that all truthful statements are also constitutionally protected. Even though a false implication may be drawn by the public, there is no redress for its servant. Where public officers and public affairs are concerned, there can be no libel by innuendo. Schaefer v. Lynch, C. Strada v. Connecticut newspaper. Just as the goal of a free and active press protects false statements of fact regarding public figures published without malice, so too must protect the law of truthful facts that may give rise to false innuendos or inference. Second, as a result of their fame, public figures enjoy a platform that allows them to reach a broad audience when expressing their viewpoints. Public officials and public figures usually enjoy significantly greater access to the channels of effective communication and hence have a more realistic opportunity to counteract false statements than private individuals normally enjoy. With this benefit comes the risk of closer public scrutiny than might otherwise be the case. There's another quote. Any article replete with a replete with a snide innuendo can be hurtful to the subject, indeed may damage him and his business reputation. 
But if he's a public figure, he must bear the risk of such publicity as the price that he pays for conducting activities or business in the public arena. Yeah, but you can't just make false statements about someone. It's defamation. Third, where public affairs are concerned, the publication of true statements encourage and there be no civil or criminal liability for such regardless of ill will or improper motive on the part of the speaker. Uh, as expressed in the op-ed, the public scorn inflicted upon individuals who report abuse is a matter of great public concern. True statements about this subject should be afforded protection by the First Amendment. They're going with the First Amendment thing again. Oh, Lord. Speech about public figures and matters of public concern lies at the core of the First Amendment. See New York Times v. Sullivan. Debates on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. Given the First Amendment interests at stake in the reasoning described above, the court should hold true statements about the public figures or matters of public concern cannot support a claim for defamation by implication. In the alternative, the court should hold that when such speech is at issue, defamation by implication is permissible only if defamatory inference arises from the juxtaposition of facts or the omission of material facts in the challenge publication. At trial, Mr. Depp did not present evidence that this issue at the statements that issues were untrue at their face. He proceeded exclusively on the theory of defamation by implication. He also did not approve, attempt to prove the alleged implication arose from the juxtaposition of facts or the omissions of material facts in the op-ed. There is no dispute Mr. Depp is a public figure. He is expressing and admitted he is a public figure and tacitly conceded to this point by tendering jury instructions that required him to prove actual malice. Those who, by reason of notoriety of their achievement or by vigor and success in which the public the in which they seek the public's attention are classically are properly are properly classed as public figures. All purpose public figures must include celebrities. Speech involves matters of public concern when it fairly considered as relating to any matter of public, social, or concern of the community, and when it's a subject of legitimate news interest, that is, a subject of general interest and of value and concern to the public. Accordingly, Mr. Depp failed to prove defamation, and the jury's verdict should be set aside. Four, the jury's verdict of defamation by implication with respect to the op-ed headline statement is contrary to the law and unsupported by the facts. The jury's verdict with respect to the headline should be set aside. Okay, let's just say it's a whole thing. <laughs> uh, Ms. Heard either A, initially made or published, B, nor B, republished through a tweet. The headline statement, I spoke against SV and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change the headline. A, there is no support for the conclusion that Ms. Heard initially made or published a headline. The newspaper added the headline and Ms. Heard played no role in authoring a publication of the headline statement. I don't know. When you retweeted it, I'm pretty sure she saw the headline. There's no way you could have missed that. To establish defamation by implication, Mr. Ms. Uh, Depp must prove the elements for each statement at issue, including the first and foremost that Ms. Heard made the headline statement. There's no evidence that Ms. Heard ever made the headline statements required by defamation by implication. The newspaper added the headline. The undisputed evidence established that Ms. Heard never wrote the headline. The newspaper added it without any involvement from Ms. Heard. Ms. Heard played no role out of respect to the headline. In fact, Ms. Heard never became aware of the headline until Mr. Depp filed the lawsuit against her. Ms. Heard testified that she did not even notice it. In fact, there was a completely different headline in the paper edition, which version Ms. Heard had framed. Mr. Depp had made no attempt to challenge any of this testimony. No reasonable jury concluded that Ms. Heard made the headline statement given the evidence. Similarly, no reasonable jury can conclude that Ms. Heard published a headline. To prove publication is just generally sufficient to show that when the defendant addressed the defamatory words of the plaintiff, Another person was present, heard the words spoken, and understood the statements as referred to the plaintiff. Here, Ms. Heard never addressed the headline to the plaintiff. She never wrote or conveyed the headline message to the plaintiff, nor did she, therefore, did not publish it in the first instance. This is something that they already tried to dispute um, halfway through the trial, and the judge was like, no. <laughs> B, Ms. Heard's tweet linking the newspaper does not constitute republication under applicable law and the facts. Wait, so I'm confused. Does this go to Judge Penny or does this go to a different judge? Because if it goes to Judge Penny, Judge Penny's just going to be like, uh, no, I already, we already talked about this. I don't know. Maybe this goes to a different judge. B, Ms. Hurst's tweet linking the newspaper article does not constitute republication under application law and facts. Virginia follows the single publications rule under which the mass distribution of defamatory communications such as internet posts are not deemable to be republished each time the communication is reposted or repeated. The public policy supporting the single publication rule and the traditional principles of republication dictate that a mere hyperlink without more cannot constitute republication. Tweeting a link does not constitute republication even if the tweet includes a mere reference to the article. Yep, Judge Petty already talked about this. Rather, republication requires one, editing and transmitting the defamatory material. I think that's what... So, not only did she retweet it, but she included substance in the retweet. I think that's why Judge Penny was like, oh no, this 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 counts as republication. Two, redistributing the material with the goal of reaching a new audience. Yeah. <laughs> 
Stated differently, the republication occurs when the speaker has affirmatively reiterated the statement. Ms. Heard never edited or played any role with respect to the headline. Moreover, a brief reference to the linked article does not constitute editing the article. Ms. Heard's tweet called attention to the article and indicated that she was the author. The tweet did not edit or add content to the article in the if manner sufficient to overcome Virginia's single publication rule. Ms. Heard also never redistributed the headline statement with the goal of reaching the new audience. Tweeting a link to a prominent global newspaper article does not redistribute the material to a new audience as a matter of law. The hyperlink served as a reference to a New York Times existing audience. It did not redirect the older article to a new audience. The 2020 tweet about the 2019 article served as a reference for Router's existing audience. Got it. Not a new audience. Third party tweets at issue does not constitute republication. So they're just basically citing different cases right now. Uh, sharing a link on Twitter is not alone to make a prima facie showing that West manifested an intent to direct in the article of Virginia audience. Uh, prima facie means like at face value, if I remember correctly. Directing one segment of the Verge's readership to an article on the site by definition, only reshuffling its existing audience, not re redirecting itself to a new one. Another case. Statements that are posted to a forum that is prominently accessible to an online public has presumptively global audience. Hyperlink demonstrates neither the intent nor the ability to garner a wider audience than the initial iteration of the online statements can reach. And alerting a new audience to the existing and pre-existing statement does not publish it. While reference may call existence of an article to attention of a new audience, it does not present the defamatory contents of the article of the audience. A reference does not present the defamatory contents of the article to that audience. Declining to find republication even when the defendant made a previously published print article nearly available online. All right, so those are just different cases that they're citing. In short, Ms. Heard never affirmatively reiterated the headline as required for republication under the laws or facts. Mere, uh, repu republication occurs when the speaker has affirmatively reiterated the statement. A mere link and brief reference to the article, online article in the global newspaper is insufficient to constitute affirmative reiteration under law. See a different case. Linking to an article should not amount to republication. It doesn't matter the link added accessibility and convenience. Moreover, there is no evidence reasonably supporting a finding that Ms. Hurd republished the headline by tweeting a link to a global newspaper online. Ms. Hurd had no control over whether her link to the newspaper article included the article's headline. Ms. Hurd never typed the headline in her tweet. She simply linked the article with a short reference and did not restate the headline. Ms. Hurd never even noticed that the headline was... So this is basically just a recap right now. According under applicable laws, there is no support for finding of republication with respect to the headline, and the jury's verdict should be set aside. Five, Mr. Depp did not present evidence of actual malice. A public figure may not recover damages for defamatory falsehood without clear and convincing proof that the false statements was made with actual malice. Um, citation here. To establish actual malice, a plaintiff must demonstrate the defendant realized that his statements were false or that he subjectively entertained serious doubts as to the truth of his statement. So we're just going to read a bunch of different quotes right now from different cases. Courts should have constitutional duty to exercise independent judgment to determine whether the record established actual malice with convincing clarity. This rule of independent review assigns the judge to constitutionally responsibility that cannot be delegated to the t trier of the fact. Why does the fact-finding function be performed in the particular case by the jury or by a trial judge? Importantly, there is no... Oh, importantly, there is significant difference between proof of actual malice and mere or false uh, proof of falsity, falsity. Discredited testimony of the defendant standing alone does not constitute clear and convincing evidence of actual malice. Rather, the plaintiff must present affirmative evidence that the defendant acted with a requisite state of mind. A determination of actual malice cannot be predicated on the fact-finding negative assessment of the speaker's credibility at trial. Conversely, a jury's finding of the plaintiff's testimony is credible. It does not establish actual malice. The fact that the impartial jury unanimously reached a conclusion that the plaintiff was telling the truth does not, however, demonstrate the defendant's acted with actual malice. In short, evidence of falsity, falsity alone is not sufficient to prove actual malice. In this case, proving actual malice required showing that at the end, the op-ed was published. Ms. Heard did not believe she was abused. Did I read that wrong? Yeah. At the time the op-ed was published, Ms. Heard did not believe she was A or that she was entertained serious doubt about whether she was A. Alleging op-ed implied Mr. Depp A. Ms. Heard. Alleged defamatory meaning that Mr. Depp A. Ms. Heard. Further, because actual malice is a subjective standard, whether Ms. Heard believed she was A must be judged by her definition of A. Ms. Hurt testified unequivocally that Mr. Depp A, her physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Hurt did not believe A can be physical, emotional, or psychological. 
Ample undisputed evidence support Ms. Hur's belief that Mr. Depp a her, for example. Mr. Depp repeatedly asked Ms. Hur to cut him with a knife and threatened to cut himself in her presence when she refused to comply. Ms. Hur implored Mr. Depp not to cut himself in the recording. Cut me if you don't, I will. Please don't cut your skin. Put the knife down. So this recording right here refers to, uh, at this point, Johnny Depp felt like Amber Heard was taking everything from him. And because there was, because she was taking everything from him, he was like, you know what? Take my blood too. Take it all. Just take it all. Mr. Depp intimidated Ms. Heard by kicking cabinets and doors, screaming obscenities and smashing glass. He also destroyed property in her presence on, rare, on other occasions. Mr. Depp's testimony that he punched a bathroom sconce was right by the mirror during an argument in Hicksville. Mr. Depp's testimony that he ripped a phone off a wall in Australia. While fighting with Ms. Hurd, Mr. Depp pushed over racks of clothes and shoes in the closet and threw her clothes down the staircase. Mr. McGibbon's testimony that Mr. Depp rearranged Ms. Hurd's closet. Mr. Depp forbid Ms. Hurd from acting in movies and having meetings. Text message from Mr. Depp to Ms. Hurd stating, No goddamn meetings, no movies, why do you deviate from argument? Discussion of, discussion of text message. Mr. Depp texted Ms. Hurd, I have other uses for your throat which do not include injury. Yeah, I don't know if I really... Took that on face value. Um, I, 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 like I said, like when we saw Johnny Depp's text messages, they, they were weird. Um, and they were like artsy fartsy. But I, I don't think I really took that as like a, a threat. But okay. Mr. Depp repeatedly accused Ms. Hurd of indefinitely and promiscuity and exhibit uh, jealous and aggressive behavior, including the following. Using pain in his own blood, Mr. Depp wrote Ms. Hurd a reminder in the mirror in the house where they stayed in Australia, sta stating, starring Billy Bob and Easy Amber. He left her this reminder directly after she filmed the movie with Billy Bob Thornton. Yeah, but you got to remember the context of what happened in Australia. A lot of people believe that Amber Heard threw a bottle at Johnny Depp and it severed the tip of his finger. Mr. Depp accused Ms. Heard of having affairs with her co-stars. Mr. Depp's testimony that an argument was about his suspicion that Ms. Heard was having an affair with uh, James Franco. As Mr. Depp told Ms. Heard, I became irrational when you're doing movies that become jealous and fucking crazy, weird, and you know, we fight a lot more. Mr. Depp physically intervened when he viewed someone as a very affection towards Ms. Hurd. He testified that in order to protect Ms. Hurd's honor, I removed Kelly Sue's hand from Ms. Hurd's body and I told her, do not do that. First of all, that is my girl. Second of all, it's rude and aggressive. Yeah, like out of context, all this sounds really bad. But once we learn the context of it, we're like, oh, okay. Like a lot of people didn't really think it was as bad as it sounded. The question is not whether the jury rejected that the above conduct constitutes A as an objective matter. The question is subjective. It is whether Mr. Depp proves that these events did not cause Ms. Hurd to believe she was A. Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Hurd seriously doubted that she was A and thus failed to prove actual malice. Moreover, while DA is not limited to, what, can I say this? Physical V. <laughs> God, it, sometimes YouTube kind of irritates me a little bit, but they're being super particular about certain words used in videos. Uh, undisputed evidence. Also established Mr. Depp participated in physical fights with Ms. Hurd and used force. For example, Mr. Depp admitted that in a recording, he said, I headbutted you in the effing forehead. That doesn't break a nose. While Mr. Depp testified that he not intentionally headbutted Ms. Hurd, it does not follow that Ms. Hurd could not have concluded that he intentionally headbutted her. She could have also believed that Mr. Depp headbutting her was A, really, regardless of whether it was intentional. In other words, Mr. Depp pre presented no evidence that Ms. Hurd did not believe that his headbutt was physically A. In another recording, Mr. Depp stated, I left last night. Honestly, I swear to you because I just couldn't take the idea of being more, f the idea of more physicality, more physical A on each other. This record shows at a minimum that Mr. Depp believes the party's conduct could be interpreted as physical A of each other or that he believes Ms. Hurd's views their conduct as physical A for each other. Either conclusion supports Ms. Hurd's belief that Mr. Depp physically A her and Mr. Depp adduced no evidence to the contrary. Because Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Hurd did not believe he A her, Physically, emotionally, and psychologically, he failed to prove actual malice and the verdict must be set aside. I think this right here was, in my opinion, just like as a normal person, I think this was like their strongest argument in this 53-page thing. <laughs> Six, Mr. Depp did not present sufficient evidence to support a finding of defamation by innuendo. When a plaintiff claims that he was defamed by statements that are literally true because of false implications arising from, the implication must be reasonably drawn from the words actually used. In such cases, the plaintiff may prove defamation through innuendo and an explanation of the allegedly defamatory meaning of the statement it is not apparent on its face. The province of the innuendo is to show how the words used are defamatory and how they relate to the plaintiff, and it cannot introduce new matter nor extend the meaning of words used or make certain that which is, in fact, uncertain.
In this case, the jury's verdict in favor of Mr. Depp should be set aside because he failed to prove through innuendo the op-ed was about him and it conveys a defamatory implication that he abused Mr. Ms. Hurd. It was pretty clear and caught that Terrence Doherty's testimony, the ACLU counselor, showed that the op-ed was about Johnny Depp. And then even when Amber Heard was arguing with Camille, you know, she said it too. She's like, you know, that's why I wrote the article about him. It's about men in his power and da 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 A, no evidence surrounding the op-ed's publication would reasonably cause a reader to believe the title of the online edition is about Mr. Depp. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> How dare they say this? When a plaintiff proceeds under the defamation by implication theory, he must prove that in light of the circumstances prevailing at the time the statements were made, they, convey, they conveyed a defamatory implication of those who heard or read them. Evidence is admissible to show the circumstances surrounding the making and publication of the statement, which would reasonably cause the statement to convey a defamatory meaning to its recipients. During opening statements, counsel for Mr. Depp forecasted that, with respect to the title, he would present no evidence of circumstances surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would suggest the title is about Mr. Depp, counsel stated. After this lawsuit was filed, Ms. Hurd sta started making up more and more alleged incidents of, a B of A. And if you recall, ladies and gentlemen, the headline of the op-ed references SV, but Ms. Hurd had never made the accusation against Mr. Depp. It was never part of her allegations of A. So what changed? What changed between 2016 and 2018? We submit to you and the evidence will show when she realized the seriousness, seriousness of what she had alleged, she panicked. And she alleged S.A. I, I, I believe that as well. In other words, Mr. Depp's theory was that allegations of S.A. made after the op-ed's publication, after the commencement of the instant action, caused readers to understand the title to be about Mr. Depp. This theory finds no support in any authority and is contrary to Virginia law, which requires a plaintiff to prove that circumstances surrounding the statement's publication caused it to impart a defamatory implication. It said two years ago I became a face of D.V., I think. It was so obvious that it was about Johnny Depp. And let's see. Consistent with counsel's opening statements at trial, Mr. Depp presented no evidence that prior to or shortly after the op-ed's publication, Ms. Hurd accused him of S.A. The only evidence of prior allegations of S.A. was Ms. Hurd's testimony in the U.K. She was provided with confidentiality when testifying about incidents of S.A. She also testified that during this time the op-ed was published, she had never publicly accused Mr. Depp of S.V., not only was Ms. Hurd's testimony about S.A. in the U.K. confidential, no evidence established it was made around the time that op-ed was published. As such, Mr. Depp failed to present evidence of circumstances surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would be reasonably causing readers to believe its title was about him. Further, nothing in the op-ed suggests the title is about Mr. Depp. The title states Ms. Hurd spoke up against S.V., which does not suggest she spoke up about violence, by a particular person as opposed to violence in general. The only S.A. discussed in the op-ed was Ms. Hurd's statement that she had been harassed in S.A. by the time she was of a college girl, well before she met Mr. Depp. The title had no temporal component suggesting Ms. Hurd spoke up about, spoke up about S.V. at a particular time, coinciding with Ms. Hurd's separation from Mr. Depp. And the op-ed does not include Mr. Depp's name because nothing in the op-ed title suggests... Blah, because nothing in the op-ed suggests the title is about Mr. Depp, and he presented no evidence of extrinsic circumstances surrounding his publication that could cause the op-ed to be viewed as about him. He failed to prove through innuendo that the title imparts a defamatory implication about him. No evidence B. No evidence established contemporaneous facts surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would reasonably cause a reader to understand any of the statements as conveying a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp. At trial, Mr. Depp's theory of defamation was that the op-ed implied Mr. Depp a misheard. Day 2 at 324. Counselor for Mr. Depp asserting in opening statements that the clear implication in Ms. Hurd's op-ed dot 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 was that she was a victim of DA perpetrated by Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp maintained that this publication arose from the op-ed because of the May 27, 2016, she obtained a DV restraining order against him. Counsel for Mr. Depp noted in the opening statement that Ms. Hurd obtained a restraining order against Mr. Depp on May 27. Counsel for Mr. Depp stated in closing arguments that on May 27, Ms. Hurd walked in a courthouse in L.A., California to get a notice ex parte restraining order against Mr. Depp and in doing so ruined his life. In sum, Mr. Depp argued that the circumstances two and a half years before the op-ed's publication December 18 caused it to be defamatory. No court in Virginia, however, has ever permitted circumstances and distant from a publication to serve as innuendo serving the publication conveys a defamatory implication. 
when the publication on its face does not show that it applies to the plaintiff, the publication is not actionable unless the allegation is supporting contemporaneous facts connect the defamatory words to the plaintiff. Uh, statements or publications by the same defendant regarding one specific subject or event and made over a relatively short period of time, some of which clearly identify the plaintiff and others which do not, may be considered together for the purpose of establishing that the plaintiff was a person of or concerning whom the alleged defamatory statements were made. Explaining circumstances surrounding or circumstances prevailing at the time of the statements can result in defamatory implication because Mr. Depp presented no evidence that, within a sh relatively short period of time prior to or after the op-ed's publication, Ms. Heard asserted that he, a her, he failed to prove through innuendo that the op-ed defamed him. C. Mr. Depp cannot recover for statements Ms. Heard made during judicial proceedings, and he failed to prove that any statement in the op-ed implies he, a Ms. Heard. As explained above, Mr. Depp's theory of the case was that on May 27, 2016, Ms. Heard ruined his life by going to the courthouse and getting a restraining order. It is settled law in Virginia that words spoken or written in judicial proceedings that are relevant and pertinent to the matter under in court are absolutely privileged. In addition, because defamation claims are subject to one year statute of limitation, statements made during the restraining order proceedings are time barred. Yet, Mr. Depp has attempted to bootstrap statements that are protected by judicial immunity and time barred to the op ed through the claim of defamation by implication. This attempt failed because only implications that can be reasonably drawn from the words actually used are actionable. Viewed in the light most favorable to Mr. Depp, the most the evidence could have shown is that if a reader was previously aware of the restraining order, then the statement, two years ago I became a public figure representing DA, could remind such a reader that Ms. Heard obtained a restraining order against Mr. Depp. But a reminder of statements made in a judicial proceeding does not amount to republication of those statements. Judicial privilege may be lost when a statement made in a regular course of judicial proceeding is later republished to another audience outside the proceedings. In other words, reminding readers that Ms. Heard had once obtained a restraining order does demonstrate that the statements in the op-ed amount to imply assertion that Mr. Depp, a her, to hold otherwise would treat defamation by implication as a republication doctrine improperly allow the, re the introduction of a new matter when would and would permit recovery for the innuendo itself. Innuendo cannot introduce new matter nor extend the meaning of the words used nor make that certain which is in fact uncertain. That's a really weird <laughs> sentence. Mr. Deb did use innuendo to show that op-ed conveys that, Ms. that he, a Ms. Heard, he has attempted to recover for the innuendo itself, Ms. Heard's testimony to obtain a restraining order in a judicial proceeding. Accordingly, the jury's fate verdict in favor of Mr. Deb should be set aside. 7. The court should conduct an investigation of juror number 15 and whether jury service was proper and due process was protected. All right, guys, we're almost there. I told you, this is going to be quick. <laughs> quick. The court should investigate whether juror 15 properly served on the jury. On the jury panel list sent to counsel before, voir dire, the court noted that the individual would later be designated juror 15 had a birth year of 1945. Juror 15, however, was clearly born later than 1945. So, voir dire is the process of selecting the uh, the jury. You know how like you have a bunch of jury people, a bunch of people who showed up for a jury summon, and then the lawyers on both sides will ask questions. They do like a questionnaire thing to decide who they want to serve on jury duty. And this is something that Elaine or Ben Roddenborn, I don't know which lawyer on Amber Heard's side, they they they, they could have just picked this up when they were asking the questions. So this wasn't brought up during voir dire and this wasn't brought up during the trial. It's brought up afterwards where they're, it seems like they're just really grasping at straws. Juror 15, however, was clearly born later than 1945. Publicly available information demonstrates that he appears to be born in 1970. This discrepancy raises a question of whether Juror 15 had actually received a summons for jury duty and was properly vetted by the court to serve on the jury. Thus, the court's clerk office had a statutory obligation to verify the identity of Juror 15. But because Juror 15 was not born in 1945, it appears that identity could not have been verified through any means of identification and the code provides. It also raises questions about whether and how Juror 15 could have signed a statement affirming under penalty of perjury that he was named juror if he was 25 years younger than the person the court recognizes as juror 15. Yeah, like I said, I think it's just possible that could have been like a father-son relationship and maybe the summon was for the father and the son got it that it was for him, had the same name. Although the Virginia Supreme Court has previously construed requiring the jury panel to be made at least 48 hours for the trial to be directory rather than mandatory, it is observed that adherence to the provisions of code la 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 is required to the extent necessary to ensure due process. 
It is therefore follows that adherence to la 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 is necessary to ensure due process, even if it's viewed as a directory rather than a mandatory statute. To the extent the individual who served a jury 15 was not, in fact, the same individual on the veneer, or that the court clerk's office did not verify his identity, identify, Mr. due process was compromised. The Virginia court does not contemplate jury service by someone who is not on the veneer or veneer, I forgot how you pronounce that word, for good reason. In any case, but especially high-profile cases just this one, it is critical to ensure no person who is not on the veneer is able to serve on jury. Yeah, why did you do that, Elaine? Mr. Roddenborn, Mr. Nadehoff, <laughs> rather by inadvertence or intention. Here, the fact shows Jury 15 was decades years younger than the individual on the jury panel list, raising questions to whether they're the same or different people. Ms. Hurd therefore requests a court to investigate whether Jury 15 was properly a part of the Venor and whether prior to jury service, Jury 15 verified its information on the matter prescribed by Virginia Code, la 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 la. Ms. Hurd further requests that this court to take appropriate action based upon the results of the investigation, including, if appropriate, ordering a new trial. Conclusion! We are here, guys! For all the reasons set above and for the reasons set forth on the record during the hearings and at trial and the motions in Lamine and motions to strike, Ms. Hurd respectfully requests this court to set aside the jury verdict in favor of Mr. Depp and against Ms. Hurd in its entirety, dismiss the complaint, or the alternative, order a new trial. Ms. Hurd further requests that this court to investigate potential improper juror service and take appropriate action warranted by the results of the investigation. Respectfully submitted, Elaine Bretterhoff. All right, that was actually pretty long. I thought the last like 10 pages might have just been like junk that <laughs> I didn't have to read. But you know, that wasn't too bad. Because if you remember, I read the uh, the Rocky deposition. That was like 117 pages. So not too bad. Although I did have to take some breaks to drink some water. Anyways, y'all. So that is the new uh, post-trial motion by Team Amber Heard. I'm assuming uh, Johnny Depp's team is going to reply to this. And then I'm assuming it goes back to Judge Penny. And then she'll make a decision. I think. <laughs> Anyways, thank you so much for watching this. I will see you in the next one.